Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the United Front Football Podcast with me, uh, Big Meaty, or Dan, and Mr. M. Breezy himself. Um, we're back after another week of Premier League football. Um, more things happened, shock horror, uh, but we've still got the <laughs> transfer window happening. Uh, so there's still, actually, there's still tons of business happening. I think Chelsea have signed about another 15 players this week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Only 15? <laughs> oh, I know, it's That's been fine, a yeah. slow week for a minute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, we've had the, obviously the, the weekend's results that we'll go through shortly. But as always, uh, we do ask you for your hot takes and opinions of the, the weekend's football. And you guys have reliably chimed in over on Twitter. Make sure you go in following us over at the United uh, at United Frontcast. Uh, and you can join in next episode. Uh, we'll start off with Keeney. Uh, re again, regular uh, contributor. Uh, Ollie Watkins. Uh, two ridiculous chances wasted at the weekend. Yes, the second one's a good save. But he's got 24 feet to hit. Uh, he should have put it in the far corner, not in Raya's reach. Uh, Pickford, Pickford and Ipswich goalie just clear the ball. You keep us for a reason, not DLP. So, kind of like st sticking the boot into both Ollie Watkins and just goalkeepers <laughs> in general, I feel, I feel like. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I don't think you'll find many games where Ollie Watkins will miss both of those sitters ever. Like, usually he's pretty automatic when he gets into the penalty box. He's a he was had a really good season last year. Obviously, was really effective at the Euros, and I think he was just he scuffed the first chance. And I kind of get the argument from like what I've heard from a few people is like just the angle that he's coming onto the ball. There's not a lot of time that he can direct it, mm. but at the same time, he has got a 24 foot wide yeah. goal to try and aim at. But fair, I mean, fair play to to Raya. That kind of that kind of result. And pulling up that kind of save is the kind of thing that title winners do. Like they not weren't yeah. at the best playing against the good side. They gave up a couple of really good ch uh, chances to the opposition, and they just took their chances when they came up. Um, I don't think it was like an imperious Arsenal performance. I thought they were no. the solid, but against the very good Aston Villa side, right? Um, and yeah. same with same with the other keepers. I mean, Pickford was great last year, but he has got he's got a rick in him. The Ipswich keeper. Uh, I know a Burnley fan who said, "I've been watching him do that for three years." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just thing, like... he just doesn't think. Um... Yeah, I was surprised that Switch signed him because I know there was a whole. I know he was really good in the Championship last year, and obviously there was a highlight on. Uh, there was a spotlight on him obviously when Trafford came into Burnley and was so poor. And then when he, so when he eventually came back into the Burnley side, it was like, right, we're finally going to actually have a chance of conceding goals. And I'm thinking like the first game he played the season last year, he. Uh, Went to clear a ball, missed it completely. It just, yeah. <laughs> just rolled over the line. So it's like it's definitely got that in him. And yeah, exactly. And like, but for Murich's one, it's, it's I think someone said it on on Twitter. I saw uh, after the game. It's like teams just need to stop trying to play out from the back in that way way at Man City because it's like you are like you're gonna get you 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 run the risk of being punished against most teams if any team other than like the top sides try and play out that way like you saw with with Pickford and Evan don't even really pass out from the back that much it was just a, a poor first touch from Pickford that led to his mistake but the Murich ones like they're proper trying to sort of build up out, out from the goalkeeper first and it's like you're doing that away away against the best team in the league it's like it's, it's gonna come back and bite you in the arse especially when you were you know got such a good start in the game and then obviously fell behind like you can't be giving away those sort of easy chances so it's a that could be just mainly because of his track record with those sort of errors. That could be an area of concern for him, which would be interesting if they do stick with him moving forward for the rest of the season. Um, and if McKenna can get those mistakes out of him, I guess remains to be seen. The the Raya one, the save from Raya, like, I understand Giddy's point of like, you know, he's, he's kind of headed it straight at him. I think to give Raya a bit of credit and maybe give Watkins a bit of leeway, I think. If he, where he has the time or the reaction speed to sort of, like I say, guide it into a different part of the goal. But I think I think Neville made the point on commentary. I think he just looks at the situation and thinks, well, Raya's on his ass. Like, even if I just, if all i got to do is get a contact in this and it goes in the back of the net, I don't think he's expecting Raya to be able to get up as quickly as he did and get a hand to it. So I think it's incredible, let's say incredible reaction speed from, from Raya to even, you know, give himself a chance of saving it in the first place. And I think it's just one of them for Watkins, like... Slow start to the season in the first couple of games. He wasn't great at our place the other week, but I think, I'll be honest, I think a lot of the England players who, you know, only came back a few weeks ago have looked that sharp. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for all them to get back up to full speed, um, especially the attacking players. Defensive players seemed okay, but the, but like Eze has looked a bit not at full speed. Bowen's looks a bit not really full speed. Same with Watkins, and obviously Tony hasn't, <laughs> Tony hasn't played, so we don't know. But um, well, it's only been yeah. what, like 
it's been a month since like the end of the yeah. the Euros and stuff. And uh, it's not just the players you mentioned there. Like I've seen loads of people saying, "Why aren't they starting X, Y, and Z? And why isn't he yeah. playing as well?" It's like he's literally just got back off holiday. Like he's, no one's had a preseason. Yeah. Everyone, the season went on too long for all these players who got to the arse end of international tournaments. Um, I've seen it a load with with United saying, like, "Oh, why isn't Garnacho and, and Delit starting?" It's like they've only just got back to the fucking club. <laughs> like, yeah, give them, give them a break. Like, Everyone else has had a full preseason. That's why they're starting. But I wonder, it's, it's just going to be the same across the across the board, isn't it? Really, for a bit. Yeah, you should you should give a few months for it all to sort of level out in terms of sharpness and general fitness, right? So I think if 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 Watkins can just Watkins needs to get through it, just you know, play sort of an hour for the next couple of games, get subbed off, and just sort of like just build that sharpness and those sort of you know like instincts and certain reaction speed and stuff like that as well can build up and then i think he'll be fine but yeah it was it'll be it'll be kicking himself over that one because <laughs> it's just because that is just a golden opportunity for a striker right but now they say i thought arsenal were good value for the winner in the end like i say not their best performance but just clinical and definitely i feel like difficult game for them second second game of the season it just put a real marker down for what their intentions are this season so sort of you know watch this space of arsenal i think yeah, because Villa doubled them last year, didn't they? I think. Or they the they yeah, won one and draw yeah. one. Like it's No, one both. One both. One yeah. both games, yeah. So yeah, mark of intent, solid performance early on in the season, kind of you know, showing like you say, showing where they're at and, and in for that title charge, which uh, you know, I think they've got to win it this year. Not that not that I necessarily hope they do. Like it's, I don't want them to not. But uh if, I feel like that needs to be the, the next step for that team, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've had another one in from uh, Scott Chapman saying, uh, <laughs> it's week two. Are you both <laughs> looking forward to uh, talking about VAR each episode? Uh, no. Uh, that Bournemouth goal being disallowed looked too close to be overruled, in my opinion. Uh, what happened to the referee's call? At most, referees should have been sent to the monitor. Thoughts? Yeah, I don't know if you saw the game, or that particular game on Sunday. I've, um, I've seen the highlights. I've watched Match of the Day and stuff. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I thought, I mean, again, Newcastle felt lucky to get away with one um, at the weekend. Mm. Like they've they've not started great. Although there, there was some good bits of play, but again, like against the Bournemouth side, who are missing a lot of players, who've lost a lot of players, you'd have expected a Newcastle this Newcastle team to be doing better against them, and really lucky to not lose the game. Um, yeah, it came mm. off the top of the guy's shoulder. If like the the, the whole referee's call thing was the thing that was being said for the for the entire first weekend. And it feels like that's yeah. just been thrown in the bin already. Like, it's like, okay, so the the ref decided it was a goal. Um, then the VAR just watched it, saw it come off the top of someone's shoulder and go in. And then, like like Scott says, didn't even say, do you want to have a look at this? Because what the answer should have been is, no, nah, it's fine. That's not a handball. Yeah. But to, to say, no, it's a handball, and not even give the, the ref the chance to go and have a look at it again. Yeah, it's just a shambles, isn't it? Like... I don't think it'll cost Bournemouth too much much over the course of the season. I don't think they're going to get relegated. I don't think they're going to be top eight. But at the same time, I think it kind of Newcastle get away with one a bit. And if you if you should be winning a game, and I dare say it could have gone either way that game really, and I don't think either team could have complained too much. Uh, good chances either side, but to have a, a perfectly good goal chalked off, yeah, that's going to sting. And uh, it's not what you want to start of the season. And it's just going to get the conspiracy theories back out in it. Yeah, like I said, I was hoping it would be at least a month before it all sort of <laughs> went to shit, but no, here we are. VAR in the Premier League is ugly head once again. No, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I, the thing is, you look at the replay and your first instinct is, oh, I set the sleeve, and if I'm right in thinking that's what the that's the sort of cut-off point, mm. then that's fine. And I, and I think, um, I can't remember to agree, I agree with Jamie Redknapp here, but even he said, like, I don't know how you can look at that and conclusively say that's below the cut-off or, you know, anything like that. So it's to, to overrule it just seems like they said just send the ref to the monitor and go look we're not saying one way or the other we just think you might want to have another look at this um and obviously there's issues with that in terms of planting the seed of doubt and whatnot but i think like you said referee even then probably would have gone over and gone that looks fine to me it's hit, the, it's hit his sleeve so if we're going off the current guidelines that's a perfectly you know fine goal to award um and you partner that with uh joe linton dropping a <laughs> dropping a clothesline <laughs> on the uh, on the goalkeeper and you know what? GBL you know what <laughs> yeah exactly maybe laugh about that i think it was uh dermot gallagher was on sky the next day talking about it <laughs> he said like well it's not that bad what well, it makes it look worse because the goalkeeper's moving he's like <laughs> well, the goalkeeper was moving <laughs> it's like <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> that shouldn't negate away from the fact that he's proper just clotheslined in the sort yeah. of counter attack like right, right around the neck as well yeah that, that, that yeah. should have been a straight red the fact that it, again like got looked at again by var and nothing like surely that's yeah. if the refs missed that 
that's when the VAR is supposed to go. No, you've missed that. He's just fu- he's trying to take his head off. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a my book. That's a red card offence. <laughs> yeah, I wonder whether that's something that'll get looked at after the game and like there'll be a retrospective thing because it's technically violent conduct, <laughs> isn't it? Like, yeah, um, absolutely yeah. awful. Like you can, you just can't you can't do that. Like, yeah. it's like, I don't know whether the thing is like because he's shown the yellow, they can't then go back and turn it into a red. I don't know if that's the thing. I feel like I've seen that happen before, so I don't actually know. Yeah, yeah, because like, you, you have people like, doing the whole like cancelled yellow red card or cancelled yeah, red yellow card, right? don't you? Like... Yeah, so yeah, bizarre to me that that wasn't. Yeah, that that that, that wasn't like looked at and overturned. Like I, I, again, how they can look at the the ham that the, or the, the ham ball and say, oh yeah, that's we've seen enough to overturn this, but look at the Joe Linton one, like you say, and go, oh, just go with what the referee saw. It's it's. Yeah. it's absolutely backwards or well, maybe you only hit him with the bit of the arm that's above the shoulder or something i don't know like <laughs> you know hate maybe... it i hate it so much <laughs> <laughs> it's already happening um well speaking of uh teams not getting away with things and uh starting mm. starting very poorly uh, or not things not, go- not going that way uh, everton <clears throat> got absolutely tonked again um against spurs nonetheless like obviously we've already talked about the the mistake that jordan pickford made but man they don't look at it at all um i know they've not had the easiest first couple of games and stuff and like spurs are a very good side they put you under a lot of pressure and i dare say we'll have a a typical sean dyche type season where it feels like his team loses every week and then they finish 14th like just so- somehow it's like they'll just somehow get 42 points from somewhere and finishing them yeah like, just outside the relegation zone or something but yeah it doesn't look good for them um I feel like they're losing Anana, who, granted, there weren't a one-man team with him in the in the squad, but it's a that's a big player to miss out on. And when your replacement is with the best will in the world, players like Gay, who was at his best five six years ago, you have got Jimmy Garner, who yeah. is a decent player. I think he's a very good Championship player, maybe a Premier League squad player. But you're looking at those kind of players to come in, and same all same all, like they just can't score. They just no. they get anywhere near the goal, and they just they just don't know what to do. It's um, it's it's a worrying time, and especially when you, there's like rumors of Chelsea again being in for DCL or like him, him maybe leaving. Like it literally leaves them with very very little. Uh, I know they've yeah, a, couple, the- a couple of young players, but it's <laughs> it's it feels like and it's really sad because they're moving at that shiny new stadium next year, aren't they? But no. it, fe- it feels like they're setting up for a year in the Championship next year. It really does. And I think the concerning thing is like they sold an honor for big money. Like if DCL, I, I don't think DCL will end up going to Chelsea as we'll, we'll touch on later in terms of who they've been linked with. But if that was to happen, they get a decent like 30 odd million for him. Like the worrying thing is they're getting decent money in for their players. They just can't spend it because of like PSR rules or anything like that. And that like, I think like you pointed out that their first starting 11 at the start of the season, it looks like a bar, like a couple of players. It looks like a championship thing. Um, and I found it really interesting what Dice, uh, I caught some of his uh, comments after the game, and it was really interesting. He sort of said, like, you know, there seems to be a, I think he said, like, there's basically, there's this sort of neg- there's this weird cycle at Everton where it's like, at a really good end of the season last year, everything that went on, and we really sort of, you know, got together and regrouped and got, gained some really good momentum and results. And it feels like you're, you're, you're ready to sort of take the next step and not, and start, have a, have a good start to a season. And then it, all of a sudden, all the good work gets undone with some really bad performances. So it's like now we have to start all over again in terms of getting that belief back and getting performances back. And he's he's right. That has been Everson for the last like five years. It's like, crap, crap, crap. Start, oh, well, maybe. Maybe it on something. And it just goes to crap again. And I don't know whether it's like a cultural thing at the club. I don't know if there's a lot of uncertainty behind the scenes with like the numerous failed takeovers and, you know, the, the very well publicized money issues they've got. But it's just a, it's just, they are a club who are not in a, a good shape whatsoever at the moment. There's there's so much going on behind the scenes that must be, be like this big cloud hanging over them that maybe, and I almost don't really believe this. Because you know, that there's that old thing of like, oh, sometimes being relegated is a good thing because you can just sort of go down and reset sort of thing and look to come back up the next season. With their financial situation, I don't think Everton can. I, I, like, I think some clubs you can look at, like when Bournemouth went down, regroup for a couple of seasons, come back up. And there's other clubs you you would you would back, like Leicester, for example, like went down, you think, okay, they'll come back up, like no problem. I don't think it'll be that simple with Everton. You look what happened to Leeds, like not that long ago. It took them ages to get out of the championship. Look at Sunderland, like who have been, langu- it went down as far as League One, right? Like, 
it'd be a shame if that did happen. Like, I, Everton are such a big club and such a historic club that to, to, to almost see him in this sort of state is kind of for, for, for English football, I think is just, it's just a real shame, I think, you know. It's been a long time coming, though, I think, as well. Like, yeah, it, they've been circling the drain for a long time. Yeah, there's only there's so long you can keep paddling against it. Um, the, again, the saving grace might be that there's just three worst teams in the league this year. And they're, yeah. they're going to be there or thereabouts in terms of relegation battle. I said it last week, though. It's two games in. Yeah, they've had a couple of big, yeah. big slap ins, but they do have that one manager who has that experience in, in turning like results the right way and getting the best out of players and just getting a way to win. So like mm. that, that but again it's 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 not a uh it's not a shining example of how to run a football club, is it? It's not it's not how no. you you want to see any club be run. Um especially like what Lauren like you say, which is as previously successful and historic as, as Everton, such a big a big football club in terms of English yeah. football. Um sad to see, but We'll see how it goes over the course of the season. If um, they, they need to, first off, they just need to start getting their performances up because yeah. even when they were losing last year, maybe like I'm forgetting the early early season, but a lot of the games where they were losing, they were still at it. Yeah. And the, these first couple of games, they just have looked off the boil completely. So, yeah, scary, scary times for Everton. Um, I dare say, I mean, we'll have to see how it goes in the next couple of days, whether they can bring in a couple of reinforcements. I, I doubt they will. Just due to the money issues, and, and now they've, they've yeah. had to kind of like curtail their spending. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that the first the, the first six months is going to be a big one because I think if if the players don't seem to be buying into the manager, then it's whether the manager goes, well, I can't do anything, I'm going, or the board goes, yeah. it's, we're going to get someone else in, and then and then it's a complete just chaos theory. Then it's like anything could happen. It, they could be the worst team in the league. They might turn something around. You might get that ban- new manager bump. But yeah, so it's a, it's a worrying time for Everton fans. I think. Davey Moyes back to Everton. Who oh knows? yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of it. Like I've seen a lot of that. Is that like being Roman? Genuinely as well. Like with that West Ham link, I generally think I, I haven't seen like a link or anything. I'm just sort of throwing it out there. Like I, I, from my understanding, I think they are prone to playing four four two. Dice likes playing a four four two, right? Chucking a loan bit for Danny Ings. Because ge- genuinely, like if you're playing Calvert Lewin up front, Ings works great with a strike partner. He's worked under Dyche before. And within the right system, he's proven over the years that he can score goals. So maybe that Ings Calvert Lewin partnership could be something to be looked at. But again, it's just whether Everton can afford even half of what Danny Ings is earning at West Ham. I don't know if he, if they can really. Yeah. I mean, he's got to be a better goal scoring option than Neil Marpe, any so. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the Twitter game's not as good then. <laughs> no, I have to, no, definitely not. He's, he's king of that. He's <laughs> Well, uh, well, on to, to to brighter climbs. We'll uh, we'll move on to the the results then. We'll start off with you. Uh, the mighty West Ham beating Palace two 0 Um, mm. I guess, yeah, I, I assume you caught all of it. It was a uh, from what I've seen of it, good game. Um, I didn't I didn't watch it all uh, mm. at the time, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah, I think for the neutral, first half especially, really good game. Like, really back and forth. Both teams had chances. I think, like, a draw at halftime was fair, even though I don't think either side could have argued with going in ahead or behind. Like, Palace had a couple of really good chances as I hit the bar. Edward missed and just skinned an absolute, like, uh, a one-on-one and just shinned it right past the post. Um, and now Real made a good save. But and we had really good chances as well for Antonio and Kudus and a couple of others. Like, so it was a really back and forth open game. Um it's like, a, you know, from a if I if I wasn't spoiling one of them, I'd have enjoyed it a lot more. But when you, <laughs> when you when you when you're spoiling one of them, it's it's horrendous to watch. But no, I thought second half though, we you know made a couple of tweaks to the system, made a couple of really important substitutions, and I thought we controlled the majority of the second half. Um, I don't think Palace had a sniff in the second half really, apart from some half chances towards the end once they were two 0 down. Um, but yeah, in terms of. A reaction from the Villa defeat and seeing what Lobtegi was going to do slightly differently and how he's going to react to different game situations. Like loads of real positives again coming out from this. You know, obviously coupled with the fact we've won the game and kept a clean sheet, which given that we conceded apart from the three relegated teams the most amount of goals last year, I think is a massive boost. Um just to you know, especially for the new defenders that have come in, for the new manager and everything, is it's it's massive. Um and a big part of that defense is Max Kilman, who Second game on the spin now has been absolutely was absolutely brilliant, easily man of the match, and he had, you know had a pivotal role to play in the uh, in the second goal with that little driving run out of defence and that lovely yeah, Freddie yeah. ball for his Jared turned Bowen. It to, like, turned into Franz Beckenbauer for a bit. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely fantastic, and he was just he was just excellent all game. Mavropanos with him as well was 
Paul Rodriguez looked a lot sharper. Like it's the second game for him in the leagues, and he already looks like he's adapting with each game by the looks of it. So that was really good to see. Edson Alvarez being back from injury is massive. Um, and amazingly, one of the things I didn't think would happen, uh, Lopetegui has actually found a place in his team for Thomas Suchek, who second game in the row is just continues to do Thomas Suchek things, and it's, he's getting the best out of him. Obviously got the first goal, actually played, I felt a lot better in open play than he did against Villa. Like, was a lot more involved, like, a lot more reliable in possession, just keeping it simple, which for someone like Thomas Suchek, you just want him to do. Like, <laughs> get the ball and give it to Rodriguez or Paqueta, and they'll do the fancy stuff. Um... Yeah, just a good day all round. And obviously, wan will take, in terms of all the new signings, Kilman and wan will be the ones that come away with the, the most of the plaudits because wan came on and basically changed the game for us because Soufal was struggling against Eze and wan came on and with like, his first few touches, basically set up the first goal, <laughs> which a lovely run forward, lovely little bit of skill to get the ball to Bowen. And obviously ends up with Suchek in the back of the net. But it's a real... It's what you want, right? A, new, a couple of new signings come in, you can see the difference they're making. Um, and for one to have that immediate impact, I think it just it gives the whole club and the whole fan base a lift. Um, Against his old team as well. as well. Yeah, exactly. Like it was a good, it was a good game. I was surprised, very surprised that he didn't start the game because Soufal was one of the weak points, as was Antonio, and they both were again the first two to get hooks. Um, and I thought it was Wam Saka was really good, and I actually thought full Krug. Like I, I saw a stat, like I think he of the of game week two. He was second for most like aerial duels one, and he was on the pitch for half an hour. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, Unit. just yeah, just going on there and doing what he's we signed him to do, right? Be that big man up front to hold the ball up and and link play. But also, you, it's that thing we've had over the years, and it's just about whether you can stay in the team. But when other strikers have come in and taken Antonio's spot, it's that thing you notice of like. The intelligence, there's all different types of runs they make. The intelligence there runs in terms of dragging defenders out of out position, creating space for others and stuff like that. Like just little things like that you're noticing and going, oh, okay, this is what an actual striker does. <laughs> Rather than like Miguel Antonio, who, bless him, just bulldozes through people. Yeah. <laughs> runs really fast in one direction. Basically, even, yeah. Not even that fast um, anymore, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I, I, I bless, bless. I, I love Antonio. I do think his time is coming to an end. I, 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 last year of his contract, I'll be very surprised if he gets a new one this year. Um, but yeah, just look, main takeaways are just looking forward to seeing more full crook. Um, I, I'll be amazed if he, I think he'll start tomorrow night in the cup, and I think he'll probably start against City the weekend as well. Uh, I'll be ama- and same with Wambasaka. Uh, to Debo, probably have to wait a little bit if uh, Mavra Palace carries on playing as, as he has done. Um, and like I said, we got we got selection problems, which is a good prop, good problems. Like I say, Alvarez being back, what do you now do with Suchek or Paqueta or Rodriguez? Like these are all good problems for the manager to have. Um, and that's before we even get Somerville into into the team somehow. So yeah, just a really, really important win because you don't want to go into that city game on zero points and then knowing you're gonna go into the national break on zero out of three because all the crap that's gonna come from, you know. Moise's mates in the media and stuff of like, oh, be careful what you wish for and all this sort of stuff. Like, it just would have been a lot to deal with in his first sort of few games in charge. I think just getting that first win under his belt and three points from uh, the opening three games being what Villa at home, Palace away, and City at home. It's a pretty decent return. I think most would have probably taken that. And then you can sort of look at the rest of the sort of fixtures into the next couple of months after the end of break and really look to kick on, hopefully. So, yeah, like I said, I don't know. I, I know, I know I don't, I'm sure you called the highlights. I don't know what your uh, takeaways were from a, from a West Ham perspective. Were well. yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, similar to what what I, to what you saw. Really, I, th- I thought in times um, Palace had a bit bit of a stranglehold in the first half. It seemed from the highlights, maybe the way it was cut, uh, but just couldn't really do anything with it. And I think the more that you grew into the game, the more you just kind of like took the game away from them. Like and like you said, second half was was a West Ham. It was a West Ham win fairly easily. Really impressed with the defense in the midfield. Thought like from what I saw, just, just well drilled already. Starting to get get link ups. Love seeing Wambasaka come on, change a game. Uh, look forward to him against Doku. <laughs> He's meant. He just yeah. loves, he just loves pocketing City foot wingers. So like he'll be great for you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that's the thing. It's given us a bit of hope for. It's given me anyway. Not I'm not speaking about it. It's given me like a smidgen of hope going into the City game. Obviously, it depends on how it goes tomorrow night against Bournemouth and stuff. I, I want to take the cup seriously, of course. But like, just a win gives you like a five percent bit of hope going into the City game of like, hey, it's early in the season. Good time to play him. And like I say, if Wan-Bissaka comes in. You never know, right? You yeah. never know. Um, and it's like good. I say, especially against their wingers. Yeah, it's good as well, like seeing players come off the bench who are actually good quality players who can be game changers. Yeah. Like you say, when Somerville gets a little bit more into it as well, 
like you've got different options, different tools for different jobs, and players you can change a game coming off the bench because it did feel like a lot of the the Moisey era. It was you got eleven players if they're all fit on the bench. You've got a few centre backs and like pl- players who aren't really going to change things. It's like just emergency yeah. options there were, and it's the same with us this year. Like it's nice to actually look at our bench and go, oh look, we've got Garnacho on the bench who can come on and do some zerg. Mm. Like actually have players who can impact the game off the bench. It's great. To, it's nice to look look around and see that. And not only that, you know, it gives you the opportunity to give people a day off or. You know, if you don't need big physical presences like like Sushek in the middle of the park, you can play someone a little bit more dynamic in there or something. Or, you know, just like I say, different different tools for different jobs. And um, yeah, so a solid win away against Palace. I do worry about Palace a little bit after watching the first couple of games, um, especially if Gahey does end up leaving as well, because it feels like like the the rumors just keep getting hotter and hotter. I think Liverpool are yeah. being rumored with him now as well. Um, like the and obviously the Newcastle links have been really strong. It's just the fee. My concern is that like when you lose the players they've lost, like you lose Elise. I didn't expect Anderson to go, and he's obviously got a Fulham now. Yeah, it's if, a weird one. If Gay goes as well, like you you're losing a lot of very important players in that in that team there. Uh, uh, you know, as a as good as he is, I don't think he he's he's not a one man team kind of player. Like he's he's. You know, a very good number ten, and he'll create chances. Mm. But he needs other players around him to help. Um, Wharton's obviously good, and the, like they brought in Saar and Kamada and and players like that. But I don't think Saar. It's like Saar's is the best will in the world. He's been playing down in the championship for the last few years. He's not a Michael Elise replacement. Like he's not. Mm. He's not a one for one. Um, uh, I don't think Kamada is either. Like no, to be like, I, I think Kamada's more than I know. He played. I know Frankfurt. He plays in that sort of double 10 system you know on the glass and stuff but he's not he's probably more akin to an essay than he is an elise like probably even less dynamic than that like he's good with the ball his feet but he's not particularly quick like he's not got that quick burst of of speed to get away from a couple of players like and i think they played they played edward there on on saturday against us and it's just he's just not very good <laughs> it's, <kind of> like, <laughs> it's just yeah, replacing him is a real is good. That that's going to be the real kicker for for Palace this year. It feels like, um, yeah. yeah, they've got Mateta coming in as well. Like, so hopefully he'll give him a little bit of goal scoring. If Mateta keeps his shirt tucked in, he'll bag a few. Like, <laughs> it, it is. My, I think my concern with him is like that is just that defense. Like the fact that you lose. Yeah, two, two of outside of the top six, probably the two best center, the, the best centre back partnership in the league last year. Um, yeah. and probably including a couple in that top six as well, to be honest. But um, the, really good last year, and the fact that you've lost half of it and maybe losing all of it is is a concern. Without bringing in significant um, like experience in there. So it'd be interesting to see, yeah. A, if he does go, and B, if they try and replace him, who they, they bring bring in to, to do that. Well, the one that I think there's a lot of noise around at the moment, and I think he... I... From what I've seen being reported and stuff, I get the impression the deal is sort of like they're ready to go once Gay he leaves, and I think that's Le- Lacroix, Lacroix from um. Oh yeah, yeah. Classic FM centre back, everyone knows him. But yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I think he's the one that's been earmarked to come in and replace. By the looks of it, Gay he. But that's the only centre back link I've really seen. I've not seen him link with a replacement for Anderson. I know they brought in uh, a, a defender from from Betis over the summer. So whether he. Is going to be the guy to. Sort of, it's going to be him, Laquire, and whoever else yeah, in Tr- that back. Teddy Riyad. He's um, a Barcelona youth. Like you know, he, he, yeah. he was just on loan um, at, at Betis last year. But uh, by all accounts, because when I saw him moving, because he was announced really, really early. I think like almost just yeah. as the season locked off at the end of last year, didn't it? Um, so I did a bit of looking in, into him, and you know, lo- looking at what people were saying about him. Seems like a really good talent, like young kid. He's a pretty big left sided centre back, so he could be a good step in. Um, but yeah, it's just it's losing those two people who have got a really good partnership yeah. together. Like losing them both at the same time, it's is a concern for them. Um, yeah, but, you know they're probably going to finish above Everton. So they're probably fine. <laughs> That's the thing. Like I've seen, I've seen quite a lot of people. You know, when everyone did their like Premier League like table predictions and stuff, and like er, like loads of people had Palace down as dark horses and a team that could finish like in, in challenge for the European places and stuff, which. You know, off the back of last season's uh, end of last season's form is completely fair, but now I see after two games I've seen that completely switch, and it's like, well, Palace are getting relegated. It's like I, I think the truth is, the truth, unfortunately for Palace fans, is probably somewhere in the middle, and I think it's probably going to be because as good of a coach as Glasner is, and they are going to be better this year than they were, you know, 
under Hodgson at the time where Hodgson left last season. Um, but well, one, it's it's if I don't repl- the, the worries they've got is they say not adequately replacing the players that are leaving. They've even I know John Nayu's not exactly a first teamer anymore, but again, his experience head out the door. I've seen rumors today that Edouard could be leaving as well. So that's another player they're going. To, that's probably obviously to make way for Enketia coming in. But it's a lot of it's a lot of change to what felt like a pretty settled team, and it hasn't even happened over the summer. It's happened now this, once the season's kicked off. So there's a lot of disruption. And obviously, if Glasner continues to do really well, is his future even guaranteed in terms of being able to keep a hold of him unless a bigger club comes in looking for um, a new manager? But I think if they, if they keep hold of Glasner and get these sort of signings over the line before the end of the deadline, I think they'll only be fine. And I know Palace fans won't want to hear this. It might just be another season of finishing between 14th and 11th, which I know is what they always do. But it just feels like it, it feels like Palace have been here a couple of times. They're on the verge of doing something quite good and quite like for you know special by their standards. And then it all just like player leaves or a manager leaves or whatever, and it just they kind of have to hit the reset button again. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of the way yeah. with a lot of teams around that, that part of the the table, though, isn't it? Like if you as soon as you start getting play, I mean, perfect example: Anderson, Gay, and Elise and Eze. Like mm. as soon as the season was over, it's like right, where are these going? Mm. Like is he yeah. is he going to live? Where are these going? Where, where are all these good players going? It's like oh, well, the the still Palace players now. I know I know most of them have gone now or will be going. But it just must be, yeah. Like it feels like two steps forward, three steps back a lot of the time. Because it's like, okay, well, yeah. And and whilst whilst it is rubbish, it does give Glasner a bit of cash to play with. It does let him get his kind yeah. of players in. So maybe take like taking the pill for for one year, so that he can plan and, and bring the right kind of players in going forward. Because like, let's be honest, like with the. The structure they've got there, they've unearthed loads of really good players who've come in. Obviously, yeah. SA and Elise from um, from the Championship, Wharton, Gahey picking up for, for a pretty cheap fee from from Chelsea. Like the players they bring in and bring through, and they've got a really good academy as well. Maybe just taking that bit of pill for the twelve for twelve months to see where Glasgow wants to spend some money and and invest. Yeah, to bring in the the right kind of players around them. And build on it and grow from that. Then maybe maybe it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you've uh, sometimes you just got to take the off season. And I know it feels like it could it must be like every season's an off season for him. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, sometimes it can just take that that one year of of of, of proper planning with a proper coach with a proper team to then take the next steps forward. I mean, and look at like yeah. look at the teams we've done it the last few. Years. Like look at where Villa were after they, they came up. Like you know, yeah. With, with with Gerard in charge and they weren't really doing anything, it was a bit of like disjointed. They brought brought a good manager in and granted got these good got the players clicking straight away, but like they've brought in the right kind of players. He he knows who he wants to move on, who he wants to leave. They're in the Champions League. They're you know they're up at the top of the the, the league now. They're, they're playing good football. Like it's it, it could just take one or two things um, and a bit of investment, obviously. But like you you never know what can happen. There's it, there's seemingly no end of teams who want to drop out of that top eight at the minute. So in the next, yeah, exactly. over the next few years, who knows where anyone's going to be? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. They still, they say, still got, they still got good talent there. Like I say, as a Decore obviously hasn't started the season yet, but he'll come in and be and be great. And Adam Morton, I think that's a really good set, like trio of players there. And I think in Ketty, if he does move there, will be a really, really that that seems like the perfect. I think move it's confirmed for now. The Inketi like, deal. Oh, it's actually been confirmed. Oh, yeah, there you go. Like. I, that's the, the forest move never really made sense to me, but yeah, I think Palace always felt like just a good fit for someone like Inketia, you know. So I think he'll maybe it's a case of tweaking the system and playing two up top and having Maketa, uh, Maketa, Mateta and Inketia sort of uh, be a partnership with Eze in behind, then that could be really deadly. So I don't think it's all, it's certainly not all doom and gloom for Palace, but I think it's just a case of maybe for neutrals anyway, just sort of uh, obviously Palace fans can dream, like I'm not going to tell them they can't, but I think for neutrals, maybe just sort of calming down a little bit and just sort of like, you know reassessing where Palace are going to end up this year. Yeah, and you know, if you if they need a, an experienced centre-back, I've got one former £80 million centre-back who I'd, I'd drive down myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he had, he did he did have a massive hand in Brighton getting a result of the weekend, yeah. so I don't know if it's going to be that welcome at Palace, but it seems like a good segue to go on to uh, the <sighs> event at the Amex uh, Saturday uh... lunchtime. Um, from, before, before, before I let you go on to it, from my perspective, as someone, you know, as a, as a neutral, I thought United were pretty unlucky, to be honest. I say unlucky, like, I thought I thought a draw would have been a more than fair result in the way in the way the game played in the way the game played out, and it was just two moments of really just shit defending that 
cost United ultimately, it feels like. And just and some rotten luck up the other end, obviously, with the uh with the Xerxes knee. Uh which... <laughs> Yeah, I mean I, I'm glad you said that because if rotten. you listen if you listen to any radio station or, you know, in Twitter account or whatever or podcast, you'd think that United were terrible and like were playing just as badly uh-huh. as they did last year. Like all of I'm really surprised last couple of days the amount of like oh well it's obviously like Ten Hag's got to go now he's crap like United are still shit it's like and I, all I was thinking was did I watch a different game like I thought yeah. we, were, we were playing I don't think the progression through the pitch was quite snappy enough but I thought playing out from the back keeping control of possession uh, I thought we pressed really well from the front we forced them into mistakes I thought we made enough chances to actually win that game same story as the yeah. first first game against Fulham though. It was I like just the last pass was just a little bit late and they were offside or couldn't get the finish off and obviously like you say, rotten luck with uh, the ball just bouncing off Xerxes I'm on the line. Um, look, it's it's not a goal. He's offside. It's just it's yeah. shit in it. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's like I saw I saw uh, Goldbridge's tweet being like, I should change the rules. It's yeah. like I get it. I get it. It's really annoying, but that is the rule. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, just like. But, it's like yeah. you can you can make all the you can make all the uh like justifications be like well, it's, he's not really interfering though is he like <laughs> please yeah. just allow it but it's like it's just not how it works unfortunately you know but yeah I thought like I say I thought we played pretty well like we the one of the annoying things is like what I watched uh, like I just watched m- uh, match of the day before uh, just so I could catch up on everything again and I'd forgotten because I, I skipped past the United uh, game on the um the analysis of it because i'd watched it like i didn't need to watch it but i'll just see what they said about it and i'm a bit there was scratching at straws to make united look shit a bit it was like oh well they're still doing the same things as last year micah richford in, uh, R- richford rich <laughs> micah <laughs> richards in, he didn't <laughs> sound like he believed himself like when he was going oh yeah. well you see like uh, they've been out run and out sprinted it's like okay but we had more possession and more of the ball and you tend to not sprint as much uh, we've also won the ball back more, so we'd have the ball for larger periods of the game. I thought we created the better chances. It's, again, like, I, I hate to come across like it's the, oh, it's the, the against Man United agenda, but, like, generally sometimes <laughs> I think, like, no, like, is there something going on? Like, because I, I hate it when I see other people doing it. It's like, oh, the anti-United agenda, and it's like, no, it's not. It's like, we were shit last year. But when you see an actual decent performance away against a Brighton team who's been having the smoke blown up their ass for the last four or five years with a, with really good players who've been playing really well, they twatted us twice last year, like just like we were nowhere near them. And we have a really close game. It could have gone either way. Like you say, a draw might have been a fair result. We should have been a bit more clinical. And at the end of the day, if our defenders don't switch their brains off on on the ninetieth minute, it, it ends one all. Um, but yeah, it was just yeah. it was just a bit of horrific defending, really. I just I, th- I thought we played well. I think I think each game we've played a little bit better. I think the presses look better, the passings look better, the movements look better. We are lacking that ultra mobile midfielder, but we've just signed a guy, eh? so hopefully that fills that yeah. gap that gap in there. Um, Delict, I thought looked good, really good when he came on. Um, there was people saying, "Why are you bringing off Maguire?" It's like, well, we're forgetting that he didn't bother clearing that ball for the first goal. <laughs> yeah, I like completely completely lost his man, completely yeah. switched off, didn't know what was going on. Like not, he was fully at fault for the first not, goal. Not only that, like Delict cut out two really important crosses at the near post that could have ended up in the back of the net. Like I thought he mm-hmm. looked solid when he's come on. And again, he's another player that people are clamoring for. Well, why isn't he starting? It's like he's literally just joined the club. He's not had a preseason. He he left uh, Bayern t- three weeks ago after being at the Euros. Yeah. Like he's just get everyone's getting match fit. The only reason Maz Rowley yeah. started is because we ain't got any fucking fullbacks. <laughs> yeah, I had this, I had this argument with a, with a with a West Ham fan. Like it was, it was like because we we had a similar thing of like because we we obviously named non change eleven from the Villa game to the Palace game. It was like why is he not playing full Krug or 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 like Wamba Saka? I was like, well, Wamba Saka has only been here less than a week and had a knock in pre season. Like I'm sure he's going to come on eventually. And full Krug, yeah, had has been with us for two weeks and not even had a full pre season. So it's like it, it's that thing and. I think someone said that. Well, United you know playing Mass Railway. It's like, yeah, he didn't have an international tournament in the summer, like, yeah. and he's and he's had a full preseason. And United are fucked at fullback, so he kind of yeah. has to. We've, we've <laughs> got one fullback. He has to play. <laughs> yeah, like... and he didn't even, he didn't even play in the uh, the charity shield. Like we ended up playing bloody no. Martinez out at left back. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, like, uh, yeah. It, it's it's desperation measures in certain places. But like, because I've seen the same way. Like, why isn't Garnacho playing? Same reason. Why isn't X, Y, and Z playing? Same reason. Like. These players just need a little bit of time to bed in. 
I don't know. It sucks that we've not we've lost against um, Brighton, but I've I've actually seen people going, "Oh well, you know, United should be going there and winning." It's like this is the same Brighton that everyone's been in love with for the past few years. That's been play playing out of their skin. Everyone's been breaking down their tactical, uh, you know, the the tactical makeup of their team because they're overachieving so much. But suddenly United yeah. go there and and lose on a last touch in a, in a really even game, and suddenly it's. You know, United are shit again. Like, it's. Do you know what? It's that's not even a, that's not even really like a United thing. I don't think I've seen it before with other clubs of sort of around that level. And it's like they'll go and fans if they lose, like you have get fans and go, oh, you know, we've lost to Brighton. Do you know about Brighton? And it's like yeah, but like you're just looking. That's just looking at it from the perspective of Brighton aren't a mass like a big club. Really, like with the greatest of respects, you would like Brighton aren't one. Of the, Brighton aren't one of the biggest clubs in England. Like, no, no. I, I don't want to be you know not being disrespectful by saying that. They're just factually they're just not. But it's actually, if you're looking at it from just a size of club basis, yes, obviously United should be beating Brighton, but that's just not that. That's not how football works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if it was, <laughs> like, it'd, it'd be, be well easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. City being League Two, um... <laughs> <laughs> it might be soon. Uh, yeah, it's open. <laughs> yeah, but like I, I don't know. I, I thought the the my biggest uh, critique of United from uh, from that game was. Just not staying on side enough. I know it's, that's a, obviously an easy, easy thing to say. I mean, obviously it doesn't take into account how good Brighton's line was at sort of stepping up and catching United's players offside. But I did feel like it was more a case of players like Rashford and Diallo, especially, just sort of not being intelligent enough of when to make the run. Like more often than not, if that makes it was sense. Some, it, to me, some of it looked lazy. Like you can forgive yeah. if you're trying to get a jump and someone steps up and it's like everything's right. You've just kind of got ahead. There was the one that really did my head in was I can't remember which part of the game it was. I think it was the first half, where I think um, I think Mount had either dropped off or Bruno, and Diallo had kind of like gone in behind his fullback, and he was just kind of like walking, like over the halfway line, not not looking at like where all the defenders were and stuff, and he was about five yards offside. It's like if you'd have just looked, you'd have been miles on side, and you'd have had him and uh, Rashford like two on one. It'd have been an yeah. easy breakaway. And there was a couple with Rashford as well. Uh, Rashford looked like he was getting frustrated with it because there was a couple where it was like re really good runs and the ball didn't come or like really good run and it was missed time pass. And then it just seemed like he was getting a bit lazy and, and dejected and stuff. And I don't know what's going on with him. He's obviously a very good player. There's there's tons of rumors that he's talking to Paris. Um, he's that, a guy. That, like... that, that could happen in the next couple of days. If he does, I'll be going to see him go, but I'll just hope that yeah. he kind of like gets his mojo back a bit because he's just. I, I feel like he's a player that's got the weight of the world on his shoulders and the, the weight of expectation. He is like Mister Man United. He's the 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 yeah. big name, big name. Come through the academy, like obviously, like does a load of activism stuff as well. Like, and he's a a brilliant guy, and on his day, a brilliant player. I just don't know whether he he has the the mentality to to stick it out through criticism like i just don't know whether he's got that drive to to kind of to, to live with that expectation really i think uh, 20 years ago 30 years ago he'd have been a brilliant off the bench player like but i think yeah. now there's a lot of expect expectation on him after he had that 35 goal season and it's like well he's earning he's earning big money he's the, he's you know international like everyone's expecting him to be the focal point for man united and i just wonder whether he's he'd be a bad whether he'd be better in a team where he's not expected to do everything because it does feel like I, yeah. if if he's not scoring 35 goals and we're getting top four and going on a cup run then he's shit it's like uh, yeah. oh garnacho is amazing why aren't we playing garnacho every week it's like you do realize they both scored the same amount of goals last year <laughs> yeah. it's not like garnacho scored 25 goals and rashford was binning him into the row z from six yards out neither neither of them were massively productive it's just we we know where Rashford can go, and I think the hope with Garnacho is he keeps improving, rather yeah. than I, I think everyone knows like we know how good Rashi can be, just he's shown very little consistency about it, and I think a lot of that's just pressure, expectation, like criticism, and and just being just again like young successful black footballer on the back pages of the the the, the papers all the time. I just I don't know whether he's. And not that anyone looked, should, not, not that anyone should be be happy to deal with that. Not that anyone should be happy no. to put up with that kind of stuff. But it doesn't doesn't look like he can he, he can't switch it off. 
in a way that some other players I, can. I think there's, I, I think there's like, because I've seen obviously like ex United players, like the mm-hmm. usual bunch, sort of talk about like, oh, well, everyone gets criticism and like it's how about you deal with it and it's about mentality and yada, yada, yada. I think it is, I think it is. Is it, I've got a few things on that because I think it's very easy for the class of 92 who a lot of them were also academy graduates to talk about dealing with criticism when they probably didn't really have to deal with that much I know obviously Beckham in England is a I, I look at that as like a separate thing but like from a United standpoint there wasn't really a lot to criticise them about during their heyday because they were winning a lot, a, lot of, a lot of the time they were winning more often than not so I think with Rashford where he's come through been the sort of local hero at a time where United are struggling He's almost seen as the like embodiment of that, I guess, in a way. And you know, it's that thing again. You, you're the local lad, one of the few local players who academy graduates who've come through in that team. You, I think, you naturally it just gets put more on you. Like, I mean, to not to compare Marcus Rashford to Mark Noble as players, but like in terms of like, you know, their sort of status within their team. Whenever we were, whenever West Ham was struggling, Noble was one of the first ones to cop, you know, cop stick from the fan base and stuff, and sort of because people just sort of. I think people sort of look at him and go, well, come on, you you should be grabbing, grabbing the games by the scruff of the neck and like you you get it. So therefore you should be doing more and like you're not doing more. And it's like, well, that's probably, that's probably not the case. He probably is trying. It's just in a bad, it's just in a bad moment or a bit of bad form or he's just in a, in a crap team, which I think that's been applicable for Rashford at many times during his United career, whether it be bad form or crap team or whatever. Um, and again, and the other thing is uh, there's, there's criticism and there's probably the stuff that Rashford does get that goes beyond criticism of a footballing performance and that's just whether it's just constant like negative stories some of which are his own doing i understand that but like you look at like certain fan channels and the way that it feels very targeted towards rashford above certain other players or you know like say certain newspapers or certain uh like radio stations and whatnot it just feel it, he he must feel like he gets he gets it more than others who probably deserve it more yeah and like i i I couldn't even begin to imagine what that. Fit. I know the easy comeback is well, he's only next amount of week. Deal with it. Well, he's a human being at the end of the day, and I think you can see he just looks, he just looks beaten down by it. And I've said for ages, I think the best thing for Rashford to do would be to to get out of United and just go somewhere else where, like you say, that pressure isn't on him, and he can just focus on his football and be the best Marcus Rashford that he can be. Um, but I, I just don't think that'll. I know he had that one season a couple of years ago. It just doesn't look like he's ever going to get that back at the moment. Like you say, he just looks. Looks like, like I say, it just looks like the weight of the club is weighing on him. I don't think that's fair for one singular player. You know what I mean? Like... I almost feel like that one really good season he had has almost hurt the rest of it. Like, because the, yeah. the other years he was getting like, you know, 15 goals, 10 assists, and this kind of stuff. Just being like a generally pretty productive winger. He has this one breakout year, and I think every, a lot of the media and a lot of United fans go, Ronaldo too. You're gonna be you're gonna be the best player in the world. And he's like, and he doesn't, he has, and he has a couple of injuries. He has a, he has a bad year. He's not the most consistent. Like, and now it is just like constant bar- a barrage of it was, you know, United a shit because Paul Pogba's not performing for years. Now it's United a yeah. shit because because Rashford's not not performing and stuff like. Everyone likes to stick the boot in on, on Bruno Fernandez because he throws his arms about, completely missing out the point that he creates the most chances in the Premier League. Like, and no one's putting yeah. him in the back back of the fucking net. But it's just like <laughs> the, the, you'll pick one or two players and go. Like, ev- everyone's getting all the shit for this, and I think Bruno Fernandez turns around and claps back a bit. And has a bit of an attitude about it, and I think the Rashi sees it and goes, oh, for fuck, "Like this is yeah. this is never going to stop." Like as good as he, he is as a footballer, and as good as any anyone could be in their job, and but imagine going going into work all the time, doing your best, and being shit on all the time publicly. Like it's like, yeah, well, it's like what's the fucking point? Like, <laughs> yeah. like literally, you can't win. So I, I feel I feel bad for him if he does end up moving. Like I say, I'll be gutted. I'll completely understand it, and I hope he does goes and tears it up wherever he goes, whether it be PSG or Italy or where, whatever. Um, but like you know, this, by the same token, I hope he he sticks around and sticks a finger up and goes here's 20, 20 goals. You know, yeah, like just you know, just shut up, <laughs> <laughs> shut up a bit, like because yeah, it's uh, it's just sad to see because he, like I say, he has been. Like a proper cornerstone, one of the few shining lights for the last decade of of United, or like yeah. eight, eight nine years, as long as he's been in the cl- in the first team, through a really rough patch. And there's there's very few players, li- literally him and Bruno consistently are the only ones who've really stepped up and been there and been through it from, you know, the the doldrums and still winning yeah. trophies and all that kind of stuff. So, 
yeah, it's 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 sad to see. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll move on. We always do. It's not the first, it wouldn't be the first time we've sold a big name player. It won't be the last. Um, yeah, exactly. It's just it's who who comes in and and takes that mantle. I think because. <laughs> You know, well, I don't, be later. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it's, it's it's all it's all very up in the air with only two days to go, isn't there? Um, yeah, there are some there are some names floating about that are yeah, are yeah. Well, interesting. Like, just to kind of like wrap up on the game, I, I thought Brighton. Every year, I expect Brighton to drop off because I think oh, yeah. they've lost a few more players. Oh, they've changed the manager. Oh, they've done. <laughs> At the end of the day, they've just got really good footballers, and a lot of them have played a lot of football together, and they're bringing in. A lot of very good quality players now. They spent over two hundred million pounds this transfer window. About time as well, though. Yeah, like, like it the... felt like they didn't really spend last summer, despite recouping so much money for Kukurea, Saicedo, and McAllister and all that. It felt like last year wasn't they didn't really go in as much as they could have done. Whereas this year, it feels like they've really gone for it. I, I wonder whether what they did was when, when, kind of like what I was saying with uh, Palace. Like, let's just take stock of what we've got because they've still got a lot of very good players. I think we were a little bit lacking in <laughs> midfield last year. Um, but I think they've kind of like taken stock of the situation and, and seen what needs doing and then gone, all right, well, real like him, real like him, real like him. That mint lad looks mint. <laughs> he's just, he's a, he's the, he's that right winger that Newcastle needs to sign. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a shame that they had to, uh, pull some financial levers. Um, but he's, PSR, shut up. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's going to be interesting. It'll, it'll show with time whether he is just that kind of, a little bit one trick pony and he's easy to figure out or whether he does develop into a really dynamic winger uh, yeah. but he's got the he's got the raw att attributes there i think and I've, as far as i'm aware when he was in um was it fine he was out last year i think or he was yeah last yeah, year yeah, yeah. Uh, had a really good season there uh, and i think brighton looked like they've snapped up a re another really good winger so now they've just got two of the best wingers in the league uh, potentially uh, just really quick direct scary bastards uh, danny welbeck still meant I'd take him back any day, and yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just some just some really good players. I thought I actually thought when I was watching the game, one of the players that really stood out for me was uh, Van Hecker, their centre back. I thought, yeah, I thought he had a mega game. game. He was he was just like just sweeping stuff up, tracking things really well, shutting things down. He he looks like he could be um, he could be a really big player for the next few years. And what is it with Dutch centre backs at the minute? Like they've just got. It always used to be a case of the Dutch always had amazing midfielders and forwards and really shite defenders. Now they've just got like <laughs> they've got about eight world class centre backs and then like, it's like <laughs> a, a, a stri it. the striker that can't get a club and Walt Vegas on the bench. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting, man. Hecker because I think he's been there for a couple of years now. I don't know if he joined last year or the year before, but it feels like the 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 sort of spotlight was on Webster and Dunk as sort of the the, the good. Like really solid Brighton defenders, but yeah, Van Hecker, I, he really, I thought he was really, really impressive. Um, at the game on the weekend, uh, thought goalkeeper looked quite good as well. Um, not one of my was he, is he, was he, was he there last year? Is it Van Bruggen? Or I think I've got him they've mixed got, up with someone else. Well, they've got Steele and uh, Verbruggen. He's still, yeah, like, still and they kind of like yeah. still, still had a really good game. They switch yeah. depending on like what, from what I understand, it's how they're going to build up, like how they're going to play out. Um, the because I think Verbruggen is a bit better at like kind of long distribution and 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 claiming stuff, whereas Steele's a bit better mm. at quick little inter passing bits. So they kind of like pick it on a tactical thing, which is interesting, to be honest. Yeah, but, um, yeah I yeah. think Arteta said he was going to do, but never did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now, <laughs> and now I think he can't find a a, a job, can he? Because uh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so because so, he was being linked with Wolves, wasn't he? But I think they're signing yeah, Johnston no, now from Palace. Um, they are. I think Southampton are now trying to get him get him on loan, but I don't think they can afford wages. Which you know, what a fall from grace being Arsenal's first choice to relegation fodder. Um, yeah, just being like he should be England's number one. To, <laughs> yeah, to, no, he shouldn't. <laughs> I absolutely should not be. Um, no. yeah, I, again, like I thought, I thought it was a decent game. I think the the criticisms way over the top. Um, obviously, I'd have loved to have won it four 0 but. It's, uh, it's not always going to happen. The tough one is got uh, Liverpool at the weekend. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. It's going to be an interesting one because I, I'm not sure whether the way because they seem Liverpool seem to be playing a bit of a slower pace than under Klopp. I mean, everyone plays at a bit of a slower pace than the Klopp team, team is right now, but <laughs> uh, they seem like a little bit more controlled. And I wonder whether it is going to be more of a try and set up how we how we played against Man City last year and and did well. 
and try and catch him on the break. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if he put out an unchanged 11, or maybe maybe Maguire comes out for the lick now. Yeah. Um, but I, I can see... Like, I can see Rashford starting, if he's still at the club. Like, <laughs> I can still see him starting, because he loved... He, one thing he's still good at, even when he's having a crap season, he loves a banger against the team that we should be losing against. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, he, he, that, he is, is, that is what he does. He is a bit of a clutch player. He does get the he does get a goal in big games, but uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, sport. Speaking of um, Liverpool, like another solid performance from them. Not nothing drastically good, nothing drastically bad. Yeah, um, I thought they were pretty good. We obviously saw. Arsenal, we kind of discussed that a little bit earlier, right? Um, beating Villa 2-0 and a bit of a statement win for them. Um, won't go over it a bit too uh, too much because we, we kind of went pretty in on it before, didn't we? Everton as well, yeah. losing 4-0. But the, I think the big uh, the big result of the weekend, the one that shocked everyone a little bit, was uh, Chelsea 6, Wolves 2. Uh, it felt like there was about eight shots in the game and they all went in. It was a very football manager game. Um, yeah, the XG the XG numbers off the back of that game are mental. I think Wolves had like but more XG than Chelsea yeah. did. Every shot that Chelsea had just went in. <laughs> I think it was I think it was like one point four XG to Chelsea. And like, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, XG is bollocks, isn't it? But like, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, to to put six past them there, and it felt like a pretty even game up to half time. Um, obviously, like it it would went uh, one all, two all, um, and then Chelsea came out in the second half. Got a couple of early like early goals, and then it was just then they just ran over them a bit. Um, but I've said this about Chelsea. I think I said it like a bit last year, but especially going into this year, Chelsea have got very good players, and if yeah. they click, they could be a danger. I just don't know if they're going to have that consistency week to week right now. Now, if Maresca yeah. is actually managing managing them like he says they are, or he's basically gone, you're my twenty one. Sorry, guys, you're going to have to go find a new club. Um, yeah. If he is doing that and getting a, okay, well, at least we know where we stand now, and getting a team and getting a squad together, then they might do all right. Um, and all right could be anywhere from 6th to 10th. Um, I don't see him being week to week consistently good enough to uh, to kind of get into that top 4-5. But they do have, they've got really good quality players, and we've seen they can slap 6 past someone uh, when, when required. Cole Palmer is a very good footballer. Nani Madueke, I really liked him last year. I thought he didn't get enough game time. Um, f- like, what I want to see from a winger, someone who like goes on the outside or the inside, he- he'll set someone up, he'll he'll take a shot. Um, and he's he seems pretty seems pretty dynamic with it. And finally, Enzo remembered how to pass a ball to someone. So that was interesting to watch. Um, he helps. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's a difficult one with Chelsea with with this game in particular because I thought they were so. Like it's difficult because you're comparing City and Wolves, right? But I thought they were so abject against City. I know it's a really good City side, but like you say, Chelsea got good players themselves. And with this one, like, yeah, they were impressive and they looked really clinical. But at the same time, like, there were moments that worry. If I was a Chelsea fan, I'd be worried about defensively. But also, obviously, you have to be quite a good team to put six past anyone, right? But you also, I think, you also have to question the quality of the team they're playing against if they're putting six past them and. I think Wolves. I think Wolves can have a bit a really difficult season this year. Like I think I did like a, a very quick rough table prediction at the end of the year. On my, on my, you know, just I was bored the other day. I think I Wolves about twelfth. I again, only two games in, they they could still make a few signings, but they've lost some key players over the summer, and they've not. Gary O'Neill's still talking about bringing players or not bringing players in and stuff, and not replacing the likes of Kilman and Neto, and it just feels a bit fractured and a bit disjointed at Wolves at the moment, and. Like I mean, it just looked like from what I saw a match today because annoyingly it wasn't on it wasn't on Sky. I watched Newcastle Bournemouth instead. Um, just on that, like I had a bit of a mind about it over the weekend. Like I understand the Chelsea game only got moved to the Sunday because they're in the, in the Conference League and stuff, but it's a Sunday two o'clock. It doesn't interfere with a Saturday three pm blackout. Why the fuck is it not being being shown on telly? Like Sky have got Sky Plus now. There a feed for that game exists. Make it available. Yeah. Like, it's not like they've not got four hundred fucking channels anyway. Like. Main That's events, I mean. football, Sky Sports, one, two, three. Like, put it on one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I tweeted about it. Like, two or three people were like, "Oh, it's because they play on Thursdays." Like, no, no, I get that. That, that I've got. That's I understand that. But it's like, but why? Why can't they show it? It, that, it all the because there's like a few, fair few teams in the Europa League and Conference League this year, right? Like, there's going to be quite a few as we get later into the season. Quite a few Sunday two PM kickoff games. That's just the way it goes when you've got a good amount of teams in Europe. Make them available. They're not clashing with the blackout or anything. It's not so it's not harming 
lower league sides or anything, if if that's the the way you want to look at it, sort of thing. Like, why don't you make it available for people to watch? I don't, I don't get it, but yeah, yeah. It's, no, it does make sense. It it, I mean, it don't, <laughs> get, don't get me started on three pm blackout. It's all bollocks. Um... <laughs> yeah, thank you. So that's another episode in itself. I agree. Um, <laughs> if you disagree, get in touch and we can talk about it next yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I do agree with your point on Wolves, though. Like, I expected Wolves to have a really rough season last year, and I think. Yeah. Credit to Gary O'Neill and, and a lot of the players who stepped up. They they turned it like they had a very a solid season for what could be expected. I wonder whether they're going to have the season I expected them to have this year. Because again, like you say, lost a few few more players. They, they obviously lost um, what's his name, Nuno. What's his name? The midfielder who went to Saudi and last year. But oh, lost, uh, Neves. Yeah, uh, yeah she, just Neves, Nuno, whatever Portuguese name. Yeah, <laughs> Portuguese lad. They lost, yeah. lost many Portuguese lads. <laughs> yeah. they, lost, they lost another Portuguese lad uh, this this year who, yeah. uh, who's also uh, Rob Reem still in of his squad number, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I just, uh, if they don't bring in, I think the Kilman one's going to be a big one because I yeah. said it like when you signed him, I said I think he's been one of the, the better centre backs in the Premier League for a little while, and I think he's going to be a big miss. Their keeper looks. I remember Sar being really good three or four years ago. Yeah. He had a stinker, an absolute stinker at the weekend. I don't remember him impressing me that much last year. Um, I wonder whether he's just on that kind of goalkeeper tail off that they all tend to have. Um, but yeah. yeah, it could, it, yeah. again, could be a long season for Wolves. But like I say, probably still going to finish higher than Everton. So they're prob- yeah, probably going to stay in the Premier got- League. <laughs> yeah, and we've got, we've got to remember, they've played Arsenal and Chelsea's first two games. So it's, yeah. it's, it, it has been a tough start, but I think... I, I, you play against anyone shipping six, especially at home. From experience, we did it last year against Arsenal. It's uh, it's a cause for concern, and uh, that's why we've got Super Lopetegui now, and not David Moyes anymore. So just <laughs> something to bear in mind, Wolves fans. Um, that probably doesn't help mention Lopetegui to be fair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> well. We've got kind of covered the results over the the weekend, and uh, if we didn't read out your team's results, it's because your team doesn't matter. Um, yeah, we've, uh, <laughs> we, <Shout out>. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, yeah, we're only a couple of days away now from the closing of the transfer window. I always thought it closed on the second of the the third of September. Apparently, it closes on Friday now. Um, and there is a lot. There's still a lot of deals looking to be done. I think um, a lot of rumors. I mean, there's always rumors knocking around, right? But there's a lot of smoke. There are a lot of fire to go with a lot of this smoke, I think. Uh, we'll start off kind of discussing a few of the pending things, and then we'll have a bit of a chat about who we think people need to sign or where where teams are missing out or, or who needs to do what. Obviously, the ongoing Tony saga, um, Ivan Tony, is he going to Chelsea? Is he going to Saudi? It seems like he's got a deal somewhere. Um, mm. If he goes to Chelsea, surely they're just replay... I don't imagine him going... Uh, to Chelsea and being on the same wages they're offering these twenty-year-old kids, he's he's yeah. what twenty-eight now. Uh, like th- he's going to want this to be a, a his big last big contract. Th- I heard something really interesting the other day. Actually, he's never actually had a Premier League contract because he yeah. he signed his deal in the Championship, got promoted. Obviously, he'll have had a little boost off whatever from that, but he's not actually signed a new contract whilst in the Premier League. So he's never had that kind of Premier League payout. Um, so you'd assume he'd be wanting a, a pretty hefty wage. And the reason they want to get rid of Sterling and Lukaku and all these other players is because they're on hefty wages. <laughs> so like, it just doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. And the same with the seaman, right? A seaman ain't going to come in for peanuts, and he's another uh, striker who's been linked to Chelsea. Um, I don't know why Chelsea seem to want to sign a striker. I think Jackson's fine, and I think he's yeah. young. I think he shows he has that kind of Darwin Nunez thing about him for me, where it's like. If he can just get one or two things ironed out, he's going to be really good. Yeah, and I think he's got a little bit more about him, a little bit more technical ability than Darwin Nunez. And I think if he's—I yeah. mean, let's not forget—he scored what 15, 16 goals last year in the Premier League. He, yeah, it's not like really he was a, last it's year. not like he was a bum. He just needs to kind of be a little bit more clinical, and that'll that'll come with age and, and game time. If you sign a Seaman or Tony, he's just getting benched. Like, and what's the yeah. point then? Um, speaking of Chelsea as well, though, like obviously Sterling lost his squad number, lost his squad spot. Um, I think the the disrespect that's been shown to him is pretty insane. If Chelsea knew they wanted yeah, to get I rid agree. of him, why didn't they tell him at the end of last season? Why have they waited yeah. until the start of the season and gone, ah, you know that number seven? Give us that back. Um, <laughs> like, it just it just seems a bit weird. Bizarrely, it looks like United are in for him. 
um, which could yeah. go hand in hand potentially with. I mean, I, the uh, the discussion is Sancho going the other way, and you know that I'll just be like a is forty million for him, is forty million for him. You know, yeah, we, we can this... write we can write it off on the underline. I wonder though whether that Sterling going to United would mean Marcus is on a plane to Paris. Um, yeah, I feel maybe. Like, like... I feel like he'd be the, the natural replacement. Don't get me wrong, I'd rather not that not happen. The Liverpool youth graduate Man City title winner <laughs> coming to United. I saw like a few days ago, I saw like <laughs> an interview with, like Raheem Sterling in quotation marks. Oh yeah, when I was growing up, I used to be a massive United fan. I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. The media campaign started think... already. <laughs> I couldn't tell whether that's like because I've run a few reports, I couldn't tell whether it was like Chelsea inquired for Sancho first, and then United went, oh, well, Sterling's available, so maybe we could talk. Or it was the other way around. I don't, I don't know how that's come about. I, it does, It's a deal that does it. If it was to happen, I don't really understand where he fits. Like, obviously, on the left-hand side, right? But I don't know. Like, it just seems like a really odd one to me. A player's going to come in on inflated wages who, like, just does he improve? I mean, if it, he feels like a signing that United would have made when Woodward was still doing the transfers or who, whoever the, the bloke was like last year, like before obviously Ineos came in, it feels like that type of signing. Unless you can get him to come down like half his wages. He's like 300 grand a week at Chelsea. Yeah. So like, it's what? an interesting one. I felt like he would have made more sense for someone like Newcastle or like, I thought I saw Villa were linked with him. Like, I feel like that sort of move would have made way more sense for someone. Like, at this point in his career, like what, 29, 30 now? End of his career. Arguably not really good enough for like the top clubs anymore. Like, but that next bracket down could absolutely do a job. Even even Spurs, dare I say, could probably go in and do a pretty decent job at Tottenham. That's that's my concern with Sterling, and I, I don't want this to be um, confused with like disrespecting his career because that's all he's had all his career. It's just yeah. unwarranted disrespect, unwarranted bogus news articles, obviously racially driven, like, and it's bullshit the stuff that he's dealt with. He has yeah. had. If you're going off the numbers and the titles, he's had a really good, right, a top quality Premier League career. The, my issue is, is I think a lot of that was not necessarily inflated, but a lot of that City team was about creating really high quality, numerous chances per every game. And that's where he got all his goals. I think since he's been at Chelsea, he's blown hot and cold, more cold than hot. He's had a few good games, look bang average in quite a few of them. And I think a lot of that comes down to what you've just alluded to, the fact that he is 29-30 now. But he's not a 29-30 who broke into the first team at 24. He's been playing 13 football since he was 16, 17. Like, he's got that Wayne Rooney, miles on the clock kind of thing, I think. Yeah. I don't, he's he's not got that snappy uh, pace anymore. I think he's, his, te his technical ability has always been his weakness. I think his, his game intelligence and his movement and his speed has always been what was his most dangerous thing. He's not a very good, he's not very good at shooting. His passing's fine passable he's not a creative winger and i think i think now he's lost that real explosion of pace i wonder what we'd be bringing him in for because it feels like we'd just be bringing in a slower version of marcus rashford like if if yeah. people are getting pissed off about marcus rashford being offside and missing sitters like man sterling ain't the answer like <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's, he's i'm sure he's a lovely bloke and he's had a very good career but i think like like you say at this point in his career i, I don't think that's the right move and no. Maybe maybe it is just kind of like feeling out the, uh, the the potential for it. I wonder whether it's a way up of, well, we'd rather have Raheem Sterling at the club than Jaden Sancho. Um, yeah. I wonder whether it is a little bit of that. I mean, if he takes a massive pay cut and he's happy being like the option off the bench, then I don't, I, I'd understand it. Yeah. But at the same time, he's still a Liverpool youth a graduate who won titles at Man City. <laughs> like, we should... Like sometimes you just shouldn't be signing these kind of players, especially when yeah, I, I think there's as good or better options out there, if not already yeah. at the club. Um, I heard someone say, yeah, I, um, I agree. "Like Raheem Sterling at his worst, still better than Anthony at his best." I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think they're both shite at the worst and best. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but still, like, I think Sterling is. I mean, he's a, he's a guy who's won stuff. He's obviously got like he's obviously got a good mentality to to be at the level he's been at for such a long time, playing for you know, winning mm. such important things. I just don't think it's the right move. I'd I'd rather not see it happen, to be honest. Obviously, I want to see. I'd, Sancho needs to leave because he's not even been, yeah. been in the squad the last two weeks. I think his time's done. I'd I'd honestly rather let's go. All right, well, we'll we'll just take the money, the thirty million that you're going to give us. 
you can yeah. sell him somewhere else. Or, like, you know, send him to like Newcastle or Villa or, you know, somewhere who needs a bit of depth up front like, or, or an op- yeah. a proper option off the wing. And I'd, I'd rather take a punt from some French kid or something. Like, just go, all right, well, yeah. If you, if someone's just coming off the bench, then we'll just, we'll, we'll play, we'll play them instead. Yeah. I also feel the Sancho Chelsea move makes sense for him. Like, I just it don't, was a I weird don't... one when it happened. Yeah. It, I thought it was a, I think it was a I bad think... move for Chelsea, let alone a bad move for, for uh... Sterling. But I guess he was, he was at a point where he just needed to find somewhere to go. I wonder whether he's another yeah. one of these was... players who ends up going to Italy, like turning out for Maybe, Juve yeah. or something. Yeah, sorry. I meant, I meant, if if Sancho was to go to Chelsea, I mean, oh, like, sorry, I, sorry. I yeah, that, yeah. that particular move, I I don't see that making sense for Sancho either. Like, I feel like he's going to run into the exact same problems he had at United in the sense that he can't get into the team because who who they got on that left hand side? They got uh, they've been playing in Kunku there. Um, they got Neto now as well. We can play on both sides. Like Mudrick. I mean, a, he's, better than, he's better than Mudrick. Mudrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's not difficult, right? But like, it's. But like, but then again, but then like, uh, Maresca has been sort of half bigging up Madrid while also saying how shit he is, which I've quite enjoyed. Where he's like, yeah, he does so many stuff right, but he's awful at this, 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 isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it, uh, for me, Sancho, it feels like he'd be, in terms of player profile and who he plays similar to, he's, you know, he's a similar kind of player to Palmer, uh, to maybe in Kunku because he's like. He's like a guy who likes the ball at the feet and to like play intricate passes around corners and stuff. Uh, they've just sounds Jao Felix, who I think is like a, another similar kind of player who's not really a winger, not really a striker, not really a ten. Like the kind of playing pockets in half spaces and stuff. I just don't, I don't see the move. I wonder whether it is just a case of Sancho's. It's the only club that's coming for Sancho, and he he wants out. Yeah. United want to sell him, make make something happen, maybe. Um, yeah, we'll, yeah. That, that's going to be a saga that kind of rolls on for a little while. I mean, we'll move on. I mentioned it before. Agata to United. Um, it's been something that I think has been on the cards for quite a while, um, quite a few weeks now. Glad it's finally over the the you know over the line now. Uh, McTominay's moved over to Napoli. Just mm. on that time, it was the right time for him to go. I think he's a fine player. Yeah. It, like he's a decent mid-table Premier League side. I think he gives Napoli something that they want. He doesn't give us what we need in a midfielder. It's just the right move all around. He, he should have moved on two or three years ago, to be honest. But yeah, I agree. Be- better late than never. Uh, and I think Agate offers, obviously, like he's, he's a bit of a deeper ball winning kind of midfielder. He's really, really good ball player as well. He's just not, you know, he's not Perlo. So, <laughs> so obviously, everyone's going to criticize him because he's not doing 40 yard line breaking passes yeah, every, not- every second move. He's not Rodri, therefore he's shit. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's going to be the thing. Like, unfortunately, like, as great as Rodri not a lot is, of those not every around. defensive midfielder. Yeah, so as good as Rodri is, not every defensive midfielder can beat Rodri. So it's yeah. just like, let it go a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. He's meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was the same thing for years with, um, like, just Busquets. It's like, well, he's no Busquets. He's like, well, no one is. Yeah. Like, yeah, what do you right. expect? Well, um, it's like, well, it's like, it's like it, signing uh, a winger and going, well, he's not messy, so he's shit, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, ne- Neville had that be in his bonnet over... over. He went on a big rant over during the Euro. He's been, oh, England never, had never produced a bit of midfield like a Rodri or a Busquets. And it's like, okay. But you can play without them. They're not like... It's, yeah. That sort of play isn't, like, essential. To, like, obviously, it's, it's great if you've got him, but you can get by fine without having someone like that. And not only that, it's bollocks because we had Michael Carrick and never fucking played him. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, true. He's about as close to an Carrick. You should fucking know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael Carrick. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's my. But I should. I'm, I've been one of Carrick's biggest fans for years, and he, he hadn't played for West Ham for ages. But yeah, no, you're right. I've completely forgot about Carrick. He's about as close um, to a, yeah. a Rodri, an English Rodri as we've ever had, and no one, no one yeah, ever wanted um, to play him. Yeah. Disgraceful. Anyway, absolutely we'll, disgraceful. <laughs> we'll move on. We'll move off the uh, Michael Carrick. You know. <laughs> uh, big up, you know. I'm sure we could have a whole Love episode it. on that. <laughs> yeah, um, we could. We've, we've already kind of uh, covered like Gaines, Newcastle. <laughs> looks like it might be happening, but yeah. it looks like Liverpool may be sneaking in. And to be honest, <sighs> they they probably need him as well. Um, so Les signed for West Ham. Uh, what what do you know about him? Nearly. Nearly. It... Well, I th- so, well, I think this is one that's basically it's set up ready to go. Right. But I think we need to shift a couple of players. Oh, I oh. think we're trying to shift some players first, and if we don't, we still might bring him in. There's but... been a load of that this year, where it's like you, you hear of people like everything's agreed, everything's agreed, and then it's like radio silence yeah. for ten days, and then one transfer goes, and it's like bang, 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 bang. Oh, it's, it's like just 
happened with uh, Ugarte and McTominay, right? The Ugarte yeah, yeah. move very, was very reliant on whether McTominay was staying or going. So, um, yeah, I think it's been a similar situation. And we've got players who we need to ship off. Like Zuma hasn't gone yet. Aged, Corne, Ings, like all these, maybe maybe Ward Prowse. I think if Soler comes in, Ward Prowse could be the most likely, especially given the evidence I've got the last the first two games of Suchek being as good as he has been and impactful. And Lopetegui obviously likes him. Like Ward Prowse didn't go off the bench uh, against Palace, which is not a massive indicator. Two games in, but I I don't know. It, it feels like when we took Paqueta off against Villa, we brought on Ward Prowse, and he's just not a creative midfielder. Like whereas I feel like Soler, from what I know of him. Is more in that mould, and Lopetegui's work with him in the Spain sort of youth setup and stuff when he was coaching and managing there. So if he's a base, basically a very limited knowledge of him, but if he is like this sort of creative midfielder who, by the looks of it, likes arriving late in the box, him and Suchek, you, we might be getting the best of Suchek and Paqueta and in terms, you know, and sort of a, a good blend of th- their qualities. And if depending on what happens with Paqueta this season, with the you know the ban, the, you know, potentially being banned, having Soler there ready to come in and take his place would be really good forward planning and um, like forward thinking and forward planning from the club so yeah it'd be a good thing if it happens uh just need to get a couple of players out the door really and even then i think we'd probably still just go ah fuck it game in <laughs> yeah. you know I mean, um another set of legs in midfield is never a bad thing um yeah yeah i think the uh the moreno to arsenal deal has been done i think that's uh yeah, that's, that's so, over yeah. Line now, which is a good signing for them again just a bit more midfield strength it looks like they've moved out a couple of players that were just okay um mm. like obviously the there was the lad that went to fulham whose name's completely escaped me another double barreled smith row yeah another, another double barrel um who, who <laughs> scored at the weekend i always thought he was a pretty solid quality player, player just kind of quality player, yeah yeah had so, some real issues with uh with injuries so it, he'll do he'll do well there and you know maybe he'll move back further up the league in a couple of years if he gets a consistent bit of a bit of form but moreno to me feels like just a replacement for well not a replacement another option along Declan Rice because yeah. Declan Rice is meant but he also played 50 odd games last year and if he keeps yeah. doing that his legs are going to come off so um <laughs> if, <laughs> if they could just have a, a bit more a bit more depth in there because I think out wide and up front even like they're quite good at other than Erdegaard there's no one who can really come in and do that job but he's yeah that good I think if they can have like someone who can come in for a race for a game or two, or just like play alongside him and not mean that he needs to go and bomb us fire up, because he's a similar kind of player. Like, you know, he gets in the box a lot. He's a big physical presence. He's tidy on the ball. Like, he's not your classic number six. He's a proper like box to box box eight, which is what Rice is really like. We saw it pretty early yeah. last season. Started out with Rice in that six, wasn't really working. Moved him a bit higher at the pitch and brought Jorginho back in. And that's when they started clicking and things started moving a bit more. I, I think they're just another team that's looking for that prop, that number six that doesn't exist. Oh. So, um, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> good luck. I do think they need, speaking of like wingers and stuff, I do think they need a right winger because what we spoke about with Sterling, with Rice, Saka has played so many games of football since he's broken into that Arsenal team. Like, And he's now, argue, I would say, I'd say Saka is Arsenal's most important player. I think what most might not be you can make a case for Erdogan being a better overall player or other players in the squad being better ever. I think it, Saka and Saliba, I'd say are Arsenal's two most important. And you can probably chuck Rice in there as well, but Saka is definitely up there. I think and with, it feels with like... Saliba and the other defenders, I think now that they've got a little bit more with Calafiori coming in, they've got Timber yeah. back. Like I don't think you you won't see like a couple of years ago where they lose a centre back yeah. and it just all crumbles a little bit. And I think it's yeah. a, a similar kind of the uh, signing here. Um, you know, just being able to give Declan Rice, or even if he picks up a knock, not rushing back, you know, just have yeah. another really top quality player to be able to come in and, you know, and, and fill that gap and, and be be the right, one right there. I do agree yeah. with you, though, on, on Saka. Unless they're going to, like, get a bit more, like, move uh, Havertz out wide and bring in a striker or, like, have someone else play, able to play off that left, that right-hand side, sorry, um, or Trossard coming in and doing a job or something. It's it's a concern because he does feel like he just plays every bloody game, and you know the sucker limp has become a bit of a meme. But it's that in, in reality he's just getting booted off the pitch after an hour every game. <laughs> like, that's the thing, like, and I think their their other option on the right is Reese Nelson, who is a okay player who would do who would do all right in like a mid table side, but he's not 
I've never seen anything from him that would suggest he'd be like cru- a crucial squad member for a title winning side. I think they need a little bit more in that area. So I'm surprised they haven't looked at um, that area of the pitch. And again, maybe that's where I, I that's where I think a move for Sterling would make the most sense. Actually, if Sterling was going to leave, well, he's going to leave Chelsea. But if he's going to go anywhere, I think Arsenal will make the most sense. I know he plays on the left quite a lot, but he's played on the right before. Like, you know, for England well, and for... All the wingers are pretty versatile, aren't they? I mean, I'm sure Martinelli yeah. and Trossard and that can, like, play either side and... Of course, yeah. I th- but I, I don't know, I feel Martinelli and Trossard, they're more specialist left wingers. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whereas, like, I feel like someone like Sterling can play anywhere across that front yeah, three. Yeah. So I feel I feel like that would make more sense if he... It, and Arteta spoke about, you know, he's worked with Sterling before, really likes him. I feel like that, would, that signing makes more sense in my head than United going for him. So, but hopefully, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, and, uh, uh, hopefully, we can just ship, uh, make sure the Sancho to Chelsea bit happens. <laughs> yeah, and on the on, and on wingers, this is one that just popped up today, and I'm only literally only just remembered it. Um, so I popped it in the bottom running order quickly. But it's uh, it's one that's interesting to me in the sense of I I can uh, on one hand understand why they're doing it, on the other hand, can't fathom why they're doing it. Uh, Federico Chiesa being heavily linked with Liverpool. Um, as of like today or yesterday, for I think the fee is about fifteen million. Which I think when you look at it like that, is he's, he's got this really talented winger available for just fifteen million quid? I'm like, I can absolutely understand why they're taking a punt on him. The other side of me is going like, you had a very similar situation with Thiago. How have you not learnt your lesson? Because, yeah, like, a guy who's that guy's not played enough football. Like, yeah, he's getting into his late twenties. He's going to be want a significant wage. You'd think. I think he's a pretty big earner at at, at Juve. Yeah, he's, he's available for pretty cheap. But at the same time, I don't think he's better than anyone who's in the squad already. Um, and if this is a precursor to one of them leaving, I don't think it improves the squad. I think it's a really questionable, would be a really questionable bit of business. Just on the broader stroke of Liverpool, they've signed one player this summer, and it's a goalkeeper that doesn't join until next year. So they're still in the same situation where Mo Salah's contract's up in, in a year, Van Dijk's contract's up in a year, uh, Trent's contract's up in a year. They've just spent big money on one of the big goalkeeping talents in Europe who's joining next year. Does that mean Allison's leaving next year? Like, there's there's a world where they're... Uh, and uh, Robbo's contract's up in, 80, in, in two years, sorry. And he, he's getting on. He's yeah. missing a lot of games through injuries. Like, he's not the player he was five or six years ago. Liverpool are walking into a situation where their f- five top earners and five of their most productive and important players over the last five or six years could be leaving or leaving on a free. And I think that is a massive, massive bit of mismanagement from behind the scene. Granted, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I've seen it happen myself with Paul Pogba. Like, just uh, things get kicked down the road, contracts don't get sorted, you end up losing a massive asset on a free. I think the fact that you're potentially doing the same to Trent, Virgil van Dijk, and Salah at the same time is mental. Like, and it just makes this the whole thing last. Was it in January or last summer of like them turning yeah. down hundred odd million for for Mo Salah? It's like if you're turning that down, you better be damn sure he's signing a new, a new deal. Yeah, yeah. Like, because or, or maybe they were hoping they came back back in from this summer. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's because it's. You're leaving 250 million on the table there, in terms of well, like the wh- where they're at, and like that's not something they're going to re- recoup, so they can't really like spend it back into the squad. On the one hand, it's like, yeah, a few of them are aging players that need replacing anyway, and Salah and Van Dijk, if not now in the next few years, but you still need to have the money to replace them. And it's you've got yeah. this new manager in. If you want to bring new players in to fit what he wants, fair enough. But at least like have saleable assets. Don't let one of the best Premier League players in history on the right wing, who was being having hundred million pound bids for him, leave on a free, and have don't let one of the best uh, centre backs in the Premier League over the last decade leave on a free. It's it's insane. Like there's a chance that Trent signs a new deal because he's a you know a Liverpool yeah. youth, a fan and I a Liverpool think youth he's more player. Likely to there's still that that thing of like there's a lot of big teams sniffing around him, and he doesn't look particularly happy at the minute. Um, he looked re- mm. really pissed off when he got t- taken off at the weekend. I wonder whether that's just a player who's just been subbed off and looking miserable. But I think so. Yeah, like. it's it, it's a concerning uh, set of circumstances for Liverpool. I don't think them not signing anyone this summer is as big an issue as a lot of people are making. No, out, I don't. Because I think they've got a really good team. 
I think they're a bit thin in defense, which is why the gay he thing would make sense. But other than that, like I think they've got a good team for now. I think it's more the next twelve months. What what transpires yeah. is going to be the big thing. Like someone on my Discord, uh, who's a Liverpool fan, said it earlier. He said the worst New Year's news would be on January first. Trent signs a pre-contract with Real and Salah and Van Dijk are off to, yeah. to you know are off to Saudi for for massive right, money. Well. And a Liverpool are sat there going, "Where do we find three hundred million to replace these guys?" <laughs> this the thing, and like it's and obviously like Liverpool have always operated. And I know like the backroom team has sort of changed in terms of their recruitment and stuff, but Liverpool have always operated on like uh, we're not going to sort of overspend or we're going to sort of be really sort of um, uh, particular about you know profile and price and all this sort of thing. Kind of went out the water a little bit when they bid 100 million for Saicedo, but last summer. But there you go. But like they like say, it just feels like such a risk. And even if even if the even if the plan was we're going to move forward without Van Dijk, Salah. In particular, those two, and we're just like then fine, but then sell them this summer. I know it's gonna be a blow to what to slot, but if you're gonna, if you, that's the thing is, surely you would rather that than let them go into the last year of contracts and potentially lose them on a free. Um, but it's like I said the other week, they've they what more can they achieve at Liverpool? That's and that's the risk from Liverpool's side. It's like the, from the players' perspective, I don't remember Liverpool just sort of going, oh, they 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 love the club, they'll they'll definitely sign, which we're going to rush this. Whereas they're thinking, well. I've been a big part of what's been successful over the last couple of years, and you don't seem out in a rush to give me a contract. So, yeah, I'm going to keep my options open. Like, only and that. Like in their mind, they've, what, what, what more can they achieve at Liverpool? They've won everything. Not only that, like, if they're leaving on a free, they can go and get a wedge from wherever they're going. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I could definitely see... I mean, there's always been like criticism of Van Dijk. I think he's a very good centre-back. I don't think he's quite as good as he's made out to be. I think he could go and move, go to... Juve or Inter or Milan or like yeah. you know to a big a big Italian side and play for another five years, like yeah, absolutely. I think he'd, he'd step right into that in that into that pace of football. Trent's kind of got the the world at his feet a little bit. Um, again, he's got his he has got his issues in terms of his his play, but again, like I think he slots right into that that carver hull shaped hole at Real Madrid in twelve months. Um, yeah, Sal- Salah has been. The manager after Ancelotti, because obviously Ancelotti, Ancelotti, you know, I, I, I don't look at Trent as like an Ancelotti type fullback in that sense. But then if Alonso comes in, plays that sort of back through wing back system, yeah, he could definitely like, be a nice tailor made. Yeah, he could definitely be a <laughs> frimpong type wing back who gets into the box every ten minutes. Yeah. Um absolutely. So yeah, and there's that, and then obviously like Mo Salah. Uh, some, on, on my Discord earlier, they were saying, uh, "Well, what other club pays uh, Mo Salah three hundred fifty grand a week?" I was like, anyone. <laughs> yeah. Anyone yeah, with a fucking yeah. brain pays him. I don't. I don't yeah. care if he's 34, 35 and getting a bit slow. Like he's he's one of the best wingers in Premier League history. He's still got a ridiculous return amount. I argue that he's been getting underpaid underpaid at Liverpool for a decade. Like he yeah. he came in, scored goals consistently every year, and he's like he's on he's like he's not on peanuts, but he only signed that three hundred and fifty grand a week contract two years ago, two and a half years ago. Yes, I am. Um. So like he was getting underpaid then. I'd argue he's still getting underpaid now. Like you see, top scorers and, and most important players at massive clubs earning huge amounts of money, and he could go and earn that and three times more anywhere else. Uh, any anyone will pay it. Again, like a move to Italy for for some decent wages, bit slower pace. Um, he can he can take it easy there. He can obviously go and take the bag at, um in in Saudi. Um, and I don't think yeah. anyone would, would, would blame him for it. You know. Um, yeah. It'd be a statement move for them, and I. And the concern is, is with Van Dijk and Salah especially, if they both refuse to sign new contracts, I don't think anyone's bidding for them this year. Because I don't <laughs> think anyone's, I don't think anyone's going to spend money on them at the age they're at. When you can yeah. get them for, for, granted they're going to be a year older, but you can get them for completely free in in twelve months' time. So I think they've backed yeah. themselves into a really shitty corner. Um, yeah. And, Definitely uh, an interesting one to keep an eye on as the season yeah. goes. For I mean, sure. I, I'm I'm ready to embrace the uh, Liverpool game <laughs> fire uh, phase of their existence again. Um. <laughs> just just on Kaiser quickly, I was looking for it while I was talking because I did see his injury record that someone posted. Uh, I think Sky posted earlier. His injury record since twenty one the twenty one twenty two season is four hundred and twenty days injured, and eighty matches missed, which is <laughs> like that's like again, sure, like, it, <laughs> that is. like and again, I, I get I get it's a case of. Oh, he's available at that price, like 15 million euros. That's almost like 10 million quid. I get, I get it. And he, the wages are, the high wages are going to be offset by the low transfer fee. I get that. But it's like, 
if there's no guarantee you're going to be able to keep him fit for long enough to even have an impact like Thiago was, like, what's the point? Just sign Tony like, Martial. Just, just... <laughs> if, yeah. if you want to, if you want to sign a player with too much money that can just go and hang out with the physios all the time, Martial's free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's a it's a that's a bizarre one for me. If they, if they keep him fit, I think he'll actually be a really useful player for them. Um, but it's a big if. It's a massive, massive if. Don't know if it's worth the risk, but time will tell. Time will tell, I suppose. Yeah, like I say, I don't think he's better than any of the players they've got at the club already. So no, I think I, I think him coming in would would sign warning ring warning bells that someone's on the way out as well. So uh, be interesting. Yeah. Um, just to kind of like wrap it up, uh, I mean, I think you guys have had a really good transfer window. You've pretty much filled all the gaps in that you need to. You mentioned before that there's a few players that looking at moving out, um, potentially Soler coming in. Is there anywhere else you'd really like to see a little bit more kind of depth or like is there one signing that you'd, you'd be really excited to kind of see come in? Or is it just that kind of like Soler kind of f finishes off the transfer window really nicely, get a couple of players out that, that shouldn't really be here anymore? I think that would be the perfect end to a really, really almost perfect window. I think if we do all that, you know what I mean, people will. But no, you can't, any sane person can't have any complaints about how the window's gone. We've addressed, like I said the other week, we've addressed all the key, all the problem areas in the squad. If I was being like super, super picky, I would say if things was to go, go and get a young, like just a young strike, take a punt on like a young striker from South America or Europe or wherever, who's got not like, like with that, uh, Luis Guillermo. We signed in, like right outside the window. A young 18-year-old winger from Brazil who's not even going to see first-team football really until like next season probably. Go and get a striker like that because whilst we're not in Europe, you can get both with... I said get by. You can, like, full crew will be, will be great and you've got Antonio off the bench as an option as well. I think that's fine. But we need to start thinking long-term in terms of what's our, what's our striker going to look like in a couple of years because like, you know, full crew's 31, Antonio's 34 in the last year of his contract. We need to start seeing a younger profile of striker. But then that's also something you can address in the next transfer window. I just think it'd be good to have a bit of future proof in, in the sense of if you get someone in now who's a bit younger, who's not got as much, who's going to be a little bit more patient, you can then develop him and mold him into the striker you want him to be. So I, I haven't got any names. Like my, my knowledge of, um, <laughs> you know, like the, the like deep European or South American football isn't that strong, uh, as for, despite how much football manager I play. Um, well, leave that to the Twitter uh, tacticos. They all know all the best players in the world. So. Basically, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, they, they, they can let me know. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be something I'd like to see. But I think the most, imp the most pressing thing, like you said, would be getting some of the fringe players out who are never going to kick a ball again for us. Like say, Corne, Aged, Danny Ings, um, and Kurt Zuma. Get those out. If War Prowse goes, be a shame. But I think Soler coming in would, you know, would more than make up for that. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's been, it's been, it's been a really, really really good window probably I mean, to, to be fair if Aguero and Zuma leave you probably would need another centre back and if Trevor Chalib was still available definitely wouldn't say no because he's really good um, surprised Palace weren't in for him if I'm honest like if, it wouldn't surprise know, me if he Pavis. ended they ended up going in for him um, yeah like, I think they probably the will um, but yeah I, I, other than that like I say it's just me being picky I, I can't really we've got youth academy players who can step up at centre back with Mavropanos Tadebo and Kilman so I think we're I think it's been a really, really good window from us. And yeah, long live Tim Stein. Build him a statue. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a stand. Um, yeah. I mean, kind of like similar to us, it's, it's been weird watching United work with a, a modicum of sensibility and cohesion uh, and competence, really. Um, I think I think all of the signings we've made so far have made sense. They've been the kind of right kind of players, the right kind of profile, the right kind of prices. Um, I mean, I see Sky Sports are trying to inflate the Ugart fee already. It's gone from 40 million to 50 million to 60 million to 60 million pounds instead of 60 million euros. And I just, you know, you know what they're doing. Um, but I, th I, I like him as a sign in. I think he offers something that we need in midfield. Obviously, Scott's gone. Um, my only concern is we, we're relying on two left backs who've barely played for a year uh, to play at left back. And I know I know Dallo can play there, and I know he does a good job when he's there. But it also just slims down the options on both on both fullbacks then. And all all you're doing then is risking it, risking red line in two fullbacks and playing one of them out of position. Masrawi, who has had some injury issues in the past, so it'd be nice to kind of lessen his workload. If we could bring in a left back, uh, I know there's been like a few rumours of of us going in for the um, the Hungarian lad at Bournemouth, 
who's named oh, Kirk has. Yeah, uh, Kirk has. Really? And um, yeah. Anthony Robinson from Fulham as well. Like, there's been a, f a few links to those, but I think it would mean a couple of players need to leave, and I just don't see the players leaving. Um, unless there's a you know a last minute bid for a, a Sancho or a Casemiro going or something like that, um, yeah, I don't really see it happening. There's a, we've got a lot of players whose contracts are up in the summer as well. I know I've just been slating Liverpool for the same thing. Yeah, we've got players other than, key players. <laughs> yeah, yeah, other than like um, Heaton and Evans are obviously just kind of. I think they're just a one year rolling contracts so basically just yeah. co coaches at this point. But Ericsson's contracts up, Maguire's contracts up, Lindelof. Um, I think Diallo's contract's actually up, but I, th I think we've got extra options on him. So he'll be signing again. Um, so yeah, like those players would ideally like look to be moving on. Issue is Lindelof, I think he's got a duff ankle. Harry Maguire, I'd, I think he's almost worth keeping around if we don't bring in another centre-back. Yeah. Just as a fourth-choice option. If he's our fourth-choice centre-back, he's probably the best fourth-choice centre-back in the league. Um, but I don't think yeah. he's. I don't think he should be anywhere near the starting. Uh, the starting three, um, starting two or three. Um, the big one though for, uh, is is Sancho leaving, and I think, I think if he goes, there's the potential of someone coming in again. I'd I'd like to just see us take a bit of a, similar to you. I've no names. Just go find some yeah. some tricky Portuguese winger or French winger or something, and bring him in for fifteen million quid and have him on the bench every now and again. Um, yeah. The only thing that could actually start a bit of a, a trickle of actual big name signings would be if Rashford left. I think. Uh, again, yeah. hope hope it doesn't happen, but we'll see. I guess it's it's watched this space for the the last forty eight hours of it all. Um, Do you know? What? I think I think deadline day is actually going to be really interesting for a change because I think um, I think the market is kind of like softened a little bit in terms of prices. Like you're not seeing as many ridiculous transfer fees. And I think clubs have been holding out for what, for certain fees that other clubs aren't willing to pay because of like PSR or just lack of money or whatever. I think now on deadline day, you're going to see sort of selling clubs go, all right, we actually need to get these players out the door now. Like we need to actually start entertaining lower bids than what we probably would have going to. And I think then you'll sort of see a flurry of activity. Um, yeah. I was saying, saying this earlier, actually, like it feels like the, the hyperinflated prices of, three or two or three years ago three or four years ago like it's just gone like i don't you won't be mm -hmm. seeing even i mean even last year like with the the chelsea signings and stuff like i think the 100 million or pushing 100 million signings are going to be fewer and f further in between yeah especially now more players that see are seemingly willing to wait a contract out and move on a free i think that's like the sh the the makeup of a trans the transfer window and just transfer dealings in general has shifted a bit um, so yeah, you might see, you know, um, Gahey moving for 50, 50 million instead of the seventy million that they want, and that yeah. might mean that one or two players from somewhere else, from Newcastle or Liverpool, leave, and that me might mean that a couple of players come into Palace, and you just see this kind of like house of cards, yeah. kind of kind of falling around you. Um, so yeah, it, it could be an interesting one. I might actually do a uh, might do a lot. We could do a live watch along and and see what's going on with it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think if we can maybe, like I say, if we can move on Sancho, who just needs to go, and maybe one of Maguire or Lindelof, but like I say, it's, they're, they're unlikely. There's still rumours that we bring that we could be bringing in um, Rabio on on a free. He's still available on a free. Yeah, of course, available, right? Just, just just another like bit of midfield depth. Who's a you know a, a good footballer, physical presence, good on the ball. Like he's he's just more of what we need. If we can get those deals done, Sancho out and Rabio in, that's about as close to a ten out of ten window as I've seen in the last fifteen twenty years. From actually, since the the Glazers came in, because all the good yeah. transfer business really was done before the Glazers. Um, yeah, all, all you know, like you know Rio and Vidic and Evra and Rooney and Carrick and like you know Ronaldo. All these transfers were done before they all matured, and then since then, other than the odd Berbatov signing or something like that. It's all Percy, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But like, it, there's never been that like big window where we've signed like a, no. a lot of players, and I think it's just it's a window that's needed to happen for a while at United. Every year, everyone's saying we need to get rid of the deadwood, we need to move players, and we need to bring in the right kind of players. And it feels like we've got rid of a load of the deadwood. We've brought in 25 and under players who've got a bit of a history of of playing at the high end of the you know playing the right kind of football and playing at a high a high level. Rather, yeah. rather than just kind of like budging things in and relying on a midfield of McFred. 
<laughs> the McFred years. I'm, I'm Alvarez rumors have gone away. That's all. That's all. There was a, there was a few a few like a few months ago. I was like, nah, <laughs> not Edson, not my boy. <laughs> not again. Not again. <laughs> he did he did his hamstring for Mexico a few months ago. And I was like in like middle of July. I was like, get in. <laughs> Tell me it's a tear. Come on. Yeah. Like, really Be out for the year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's going nowhere. It's like, Paquette, it's like when the Paquette of Banning stuff came out. It was like, uh, so Paquette might get banned. I tried that. He's staying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and every Newcastle fan had a shit because they thought we were going to lose Bruno. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, the transfer window domino effect. You love it. Oh, <laughs> you love to see it beautiful stuff right well i think we'll wrap it up there it's been uh it's been a bumper episode obviously we could just go yeah. just got gum flapping about the uh the transfers and stuff so yeah <laughs> the next few days are going to be very interesting we'll be back uh, uh next week with the roundup of what has actually happened we'll see if this you know this all singing all dancing transfer deadline day does happen <laughs> and uh, we'll have all of the fallout from it as well um i look forward to being delighted at a uh comprehensive 6-0 win over liverpool uh, <laughs> cope um yeah we've got we've got city i've got nothing <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully one of us is happy at the weekend so uh i'm just going i'm just going for a day out at this point <laughs> yeah. just marvel at erling harland <laughs> yeah. oh he's big isn't he Ooh, oh he's big. <laughs> <laughs> right as oh, always it's gonna be... oh. it's... Sorry, it's going to be Falkirk versus Harland. Oh, my God. Oh God. <laughs> I might be... come down. You get us a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the meaty derby. Oh, oh, it's going to be fantastic. Brilliant stuff. Well, guys, thank you all for tuning in to our usual uh, hour and, well, hour and 40 of talking absolute football sense. Christ. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll be back next year. As always, don't forget to like, thumbs up, five star, whatever you can do on wherever you're watching or listening to us. And we'll see you next time. Go follow us at United Frontcast on Twitter and get involved with the opinion sharing next time. We'll see you there. Take it easy. Apologies, Southampton. <laughs> <laughs>